This program is recorded live and may feature unexpected moments, sightings, or conversations. Viewer discretion is advised. My name is Alex, and my job is to explore the world around me and take you along for the ride. That's why they call it the jungle, sweetheart. I've guided a lot of adventures and have come to realize that our planet needs us now more than it ever has before. If you don't believe in climate change, you. I've learned it's only going to be through working together that we can restore biodiversity on our planet. Join myself and my friends as we bring you into the tent of conservation and the realm of the wild itself. And along the way, we'll be exploring wild things. Do you want to talk about sustainable seafood? Do I ever? In wild places. Welcome back, everybody, to another fun-filled, super exciting, high-octane episode of Misguided. Uh, tonight, we're covering all things weather-related, which, if you don't think weather's exciting, I think there's something wrong with you, personally. Um, just going over my notes here. <coughs> super handy and useful. Um, we had a, a whole different show lined up for you guys tonight. We were going to be out with a guide uh, called Brent Leo Smith, who's kind of your, your guide extraordinaire. He's done everything, been everywhere. He knows anything you could ever want to know about the bush, but unfortunately, there's a pretty serious storm coming right out in South Africa. So he had to postpone. He's probably going to be with us next week, but we'll keep we'll keep our fingers crossed, hopefully. Uh, just checking the comments here to see. We've, it looks like we've got Chris and Mom with us tonight. Hello, both of you guys. Hope you're doing well. <coughs> We're also kind of playing around with some new equipment. We've got uh, three cameras operating tonight. We've got Jeff running the producer's booth. Jeff, you want to cut over to yourself real quick? Hi. Yeah, let's yeah, see. Let's just test everything. Make sure it's working. Here we go. Just give us a second. Technical difficulties. And Jeff, everybody, he's back there on the, uh, the producer's booth, running uh, interference for us. He's actually physically running the show. This is my first night, kind of just sitting back and hosting the show, which is new for me. We're also using a brand new microphone, which in a minute you'll be able to see on our broad angle. Uh, I call it the Selsun Blue or the Yeti. Either it's a name. Giant pill. It is a giant pill, with. Uh, afro on top <laughs> mm. <laughs> um but at any rate guys we're very happy that you could join us tonight we're just giving it a minute to see if anybody else joins us it looks like it's what about 703 704 ish um so hey if you're here if you're watching the show throw us a comment let us know you're there i know we've got chris and my mom with us uh, i don't know if anybody else is out there just yet but if you are watching say hi don't be a stranger let us know you're out there so we can chit chat and communicate with you uh, and more direct our content at what you're actually interested in watching. But again, uh, we had a whole different show lined up for you guys tonight. We we're going to be talking to Brent Leo Smith. We are going to be on a safari live in the bush of South Africa, but it's a pretty serious storm. In fact, it's upgraded its status uh, to a cyclone. Um, here. Jeff, you want to show us the, the clip here? We've got a uh, little bit of headlines from South Africa. This is a serious storm, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. I got distracted with the sound because your mom says that the audio is not matching up with the amount right now. Oh, I think there's a bit of delay. I'm noticing on the computer it seems to be lagging and, and a little bit slow. So I'm not sure what's up tonight, but I don't know. Maybe it'll figure it out as we run here. We are running a lot all in one system. Um, it's our first night trying to run it all at the same time. So just give us a little bit of uh, leeway here. I'm sorry. What would you like? Let's see what's going on in South Africa. There you go. That's not what I was talking about, but that works. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. No, no, no. Keep it, keep it. Um, guys, this is a live look to Leadwood, South Africa. Uh, we're up over a watering hole right here. And this camera is produced by uh, Brent Leo Smith's outfit called Painted Dog TV. So this is giving you a live look. It is tomorrow morning there. you got to keep that in mind. Um, but quite a, quite the serious cyclone passing through the area. I was watching that camera kind of all through the day, which for them would have been last night. Um, and there was a pretty good chunk of rain that was passing through the area. But uh, by morning, uh, the, at least the view I can see there, it looks like it's not raining at the moment. Uh, no gamer on the watering hole. But it looks like it's been blowing pretty hard and looks like it, there's been quite a lot of water coming down. Um, Nicole Smith is on the stream with us. Welcome, Nicole. There we go. Hi, Nicole. Nicole's here. But, Jeff, you could jump <laughs> us over to the, uh, the, the news syndicate out of South Africa. Let's take a look at what's going on there. 
<laughs> You'll get it. Eventually we'll get it. Uh, Maybe uh, cut yeah. to that iPhone one, the broad shot. Yeah, cut to that one. Bam, and then that should give you the option to give us... Uh, which one was it? Oh, sorry, that was in, that was in the pre-shot. We're figuring this out ah. as we go, guys. That's okay. This guy. You want to just cut to it? Straight to. Let's do it. Welcome back. Tropical Storm Eloise has uh, developed into a tropical cyclone. Tropical Storm Eloise expected to batter some parts of South Africa. It will head to South Africa and hit parts of Mopani and Vembe districts of Limbobo and Bumalanga. Limbobo disaster management units are on high alert. Tropical Cyclone Eloise is expected to hit Vembe, Capricorn, Sikukune and Mopani today. Heavy rains and strong winds are expected with possible damage to infrastructure. This this, uh, this storm started off way on the other side of Madagascar, then hit Madagascar, was then lowered down from a cyclone status back to a tropical status. It then went into the Mozambique Channel where the warm water caused the energy to increase way up into the level of a uh, tropical cyclone now. It has already started drizzling now as we speak to you. You can see that the rain has already started, started although it's still light in, in, in the meantime. And communities are being warned to expect severe weather and to prepare ahead to protect themselves. How's it, Alex? Yeah, Saturday is not going to work for us. Unfortunately, we're about to be hit by a cyclone. Um, so we've actually cancelled our live uh, events for this weekend. But um, let's try work on next weekend, Saturday. We're back. What? <laughs> Crazy I times. I think it's off this one. Crazy times. Right? Um, man, it, it, I mean, it's a serious storm out there. It dumped 12 inches of rain on Madagascar within about 20 hours, which is nuts. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I hope everybody's okay. Like Chris was saying there, I hope that the storm isn't going to impact everybody's life too much. But it is a serious storm, and it is something to be aware of, which is why Brent wasn't able to, to take us out tonight. So we'll catch up with him next week or maybe the week after. You heard him there. Uh, he, he shot me a little WhatsApp note. Uh, so I'm hoping they're all right, and I'm hoping that uh, the bush is still intact for when we get there next week. But in the meantime, uh, I've got a buddy, Marcel, who lives in South Africa. He's born and raised there who was out at, it looked like a guide training camp, and he had this wonderful clip of a very close elephant encounter. So if Jeff could cue that up for us, let's take a look at uh, Marcel's close, and he, he's the one actually filming this. So take a look here. Oh, no beautiful, place. I'm still in the shot. Um, yeah, so there's the elephant, and you've got the lead rifleman up front. The lead, uh, I, I think that's his title actually, his lead rifle. And that dude, just stands his ground look at that he's just not going to have it from this ellie which is a reasonable approach at first you, you know you don't want to cower and back away from an animal like that no hey. stop, stop it. it hey not too close boy not too close come boy you go but i can say having been in a similar situation it Move it gets your heart going Move off. So it's called misguided for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a guy does have some goals, uh, balls, Brian. That's incredible. <clears throat> All right, that was the end of that clip. Great, moving on. Okay. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you're just joining us, welcome. It looks like we've got Brian on the stream with us. Now, I understand there's a little bit of trouble tonight with mammals itself, and I actually noticed that just before I went live. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the website. I know there's a bit of a lag tonight. I'm not really sure totally. It looks like we got a comment from Chris. What does Chris have to say, Jeff? He says, I'd have to change my shorts, but I hear for a lot of animals it's better not to run. But yeah, just never know how the animal is going to react. Honestly, it's better just to do nothing most of the time. 
It's better to kind of channel your inner De Niro. What's that? I'm walking here. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. You don't take no crap from nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I see you over there, Lion. I ain't taking no crap from you. Adelise here now. Hey, oh. Brian. How you doing? Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Two Brians on the stream. Brian of the Rane. Brian of the Rane. I'm never going to get used to that. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I think like uh, any normal episode of Misguided, we, we always like to try to highlight some highlights and headlines of the week for you guys in regard to wildlife conservation related media and news. And this week, I think, is pretty straightforward. So if Jeff is uh, keeping up with us back there, you about ready? I believe so. We're trying a, a whole new system here. We've got like multiple moving parts. So if there's something that doesn't quite look polished, you guys let us know. We'd rather fix it. But we're, we're trying to like coordinate. We've got Jeff in the production booth tonight. He's actually running the show. So I can just sit back and enjoy hosting it, which is a nice change of pace. Uh, first headline out of the gate. If you're from the United States, congratulations. You just survived the last four years of hell. Uh, and we've made it to the inauguration of Joe Biden. And uh, we are officially out of the dark ages. Uh, we have a new president, a new outlook on life. We are by no means out of the woods. There's a long way to go. But with a new administration, we have a chance of turning a new leaf. And actually, this is novel, having somebody in the White House who cares about science. Right. And just a lot of those executive orders immediately. Just, I mean, we're back just in the bang, Paris Climate bang, Accord. Bang, we've bang, we've put a, a moratorium for at least the next 60 days on uh, any new oil leasing in, in all of the United States. It's just night and day back to the paris agri climate agreement like yeah. almost immediately you know just fauci said it best you know it's, it's a breath of fresh air it's it's you don't have to look over your shoulder the whole time right. i mean as as a country we we have a long way to go with to, to reconcile with what was that we just went through because there was like a big chunk of america that seemed fine with it right we're, we're not out of the woods, but at least we've got someone at the helm now that gives a shit about science. And at the end of the day, people like us don't have to work so hard anymore. We don't have to clean right. up easy messes, things that shouldn't have to be fixed. Um, I'm deeply appreciative of that. How are you guys feeling about that? How do you, f I mean, maybe you're a Republican and I'm actually just, well, I don't know, you, there's good Republicans now, like we realize. Listen, that crowd isn't watching this show. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> you never know though, this is gonna go on YouTube and speak to all kinds of audiences <laughs> <laughs> get in the truck get in the truck let's go eat up pig <laughs> that attitude that's not on this show but i'm darn happy we've got somebody who is in the white house that gives a shit about science right. that feels good we don't have to be embarrassed i want to use a robin williams line but i'm afraid that if i say it it's going to just make it weird so i'm going to just Eventually, keep going. Mm -hmm. Next up on the pike here, we've got Nigeria in the news. We've got Nigeria this week. Uh, several groups have, have well documented that Nigeria <laughs> emerges as Africa's primary export hub for ivory and pangolin, which is a bit alarming. Uh, increased political buy-in for law enforcement and inter interaction efforts, efforts at ports in East Africa have pushed wildlife smuggling westward to Nigeria. Between 1998 and 2014, the top two countries associated with ivory seizures were Tanzania and Kenya. Since 2014, Nigeria and the DRC have overtaken them. And corruption, uh, of course, is at the ports. Uh, the involvement of influential politicians and rural poverty make Nigeria an attractive waypoint for smugglers. Um, this really isn't too surprising. It's no. disheartening, uh, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, you take a look at the map there, which I know is, is very tiny for us. We can just barely see it. What? But it's highlighting to you what kinds of smugglers are operating and from what modes of transportation they're using and how they're accessing ports. Um, bottom line is this has to stop. This has to stop globally, but especially in places like Africa. Alex, you know I'm a rich man now. Are you? Want to know why? Do you have uh, ivory with you? No, I don't. So I received an email recently from a Nigerian prince that says ah, he yeah. wants to give me $2 million USD. I'm very excited. So I can use all that money to halt the trade in ivory and pangolin skulls. So you signed up for it, right? I did. Good. I'm waiting for my check. You're going to be waiting a long time, <laughs> <laughs> buddy. <laughs> buddy, you're going to be waiting a long time, right. friend. Yeah. How are the comments doing, Jeff? Anybody have anything to say? We've got a heavy title there with Nigeria and a more positive set with uh, Joe Biden. 
Well, your dad's here this evening, so that's good. Hello, Dad. There I didn't even know he was on here. Yeah. Welcome. We were just talking about Nigeria and Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm a prince now. <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris says, I just can't believe that Ivory is still so sought after. I've never gotten the appeal in the first place. Well, I mean, uh, I, I feel like the best, a good place to start, I guess, to understand, would be to hop on Netflix and watch Ivory Game. I mean, it goes through the trade and goes through the poaching and it hits to the end of it where you can take a whole like, elephant tusk and carve like an ornate town out of it and then sell it for four hundred thousand dollars you know it yeah. it's a status thing you know yeah. it's like driving a ferrari it makes or, it look cool yeah i mean it yeah. makes you look cool having a rolex <laughs> there's there's no point to it and it makes it a uniquely challenging thing to start to break down in conservation because you're ultimately talking about how cultures are viewing status yeah. and you know from a western point of view is it right for us to go into parts of the world like Vietnam, where all those uh, imports were destined for, and tell people, hey, this is weird, you shouldn't be doing this, this shouldn't be valued in your society. <laughs> it makes it deeply challenging, and I would like to see people in my own field, anthropologists, more involved in wildlife, simply because we are allegedly the ones that know how to deconstruct and work on cultural issues. Um, granted, we're supposed to be through the participant observation kind of pulled back lens but you know it, it is what it is um i agree i don't i don't see the value in it myself other people do and that's where we're at uh moving right along here we've got a little bit of positive news because that was a kind of a heavy like we had a, a happy po a happy thing white. and then we had a kind of a De debbie downer a lead white now we have another positive thing here we've got a big cat comeback ja i like that title there big cat comeback yeah right it feels good you know rolls out of the mouth. Jaguars uh, prowl Argentina's Iberia wetlands after 70 <coughs> years. Conservationists recently released three jaguars, so they were raised and then released into a preserve. A mother and two cubs into the Gran Iberian uh, Park in northeastern Argentina um, in an effort to rewild the local ecosystem. So they're taking that Attenborough approach, that grandiose sense of, we made this mess, there's a chance we might be able to clean it up too. Jaguars haven't been present in this part of Argentina for the past 70 years after hunting and habitat loss drove them to local extinction. The ultimate goal of the Jaguar reintroduction program is to reestablish a healthy, genetically diverse population of jaguars in the Gran Iberia Park, which has the capacity to hold uh, about 100 jaguars, according to conservationists. Um, you get a nice little shot there of the two cubs, absolutely adorable. Um, useless fun fact for you guys, cubs tends to be the preferred term for quote unquote big cats, kittens you use for the small cats. Any thoughts? Who cares? Who cares? Well, that's right. These terms don't matter. But, but yeah, 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 that's awesome. Um, that's cool. I mean, jigs are really neat. I mean, like, compared to the other large cats, I, I feel like they've really kind of lucked out in a lot of ways. Yeah, w would you like to know the single greatest ally of the jig? Ants. Spaniards. Spaniards. And I will tell you what. Not ants. So <coughs> you had for thousands and ho however long years, um, millions of people living in civilizations throughout Latin America. Right? And then Spain showed up. And essentially what happened was they brought smallpox and influenza and all these things. And suddenly millions of people just <laughs> vanished, right? And so then you had these vast tracts of land and civilization just suddenly gone and retaken by the jungle. And so for thousands or, thousands or hundreds of years, up until like the 60s or so, Central America was like impenetrable for a lot of people. And so largely because of, you know, the Spaniards showing up as colonists in Latin America, um, jags have been kind of pretty lucky, you know, which is kind of cool. So kind of good for animals, really bad for people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I told you it was positive. Right. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <coughs> um, how are we doing on the comments, Jeff? Anybody have anything to say? Any thoughts? Uh, this is supposed to be live and, and interactive. Uh, there also could still be a lag, so. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on tonight, but Mammal seems to be having just a little, a little bit of a hiccup, but that's fine. Um, last headline for you guys tonight. We've got spectacular orange-furred bats. I love uh -huh. this. Spectacular oh. orange-furred bats described from West African mountains. Uh, an orange-furred uh, bat has been described from the caves and mining tunnels of the Namibia Mountains in Guinea. Researchers say that the bat had such a distinctive look that they quickly recognized it was a species new to science. Uh, the newly described species, which they named Myotis nimbianus, 
uh, meaning from Namibia, may also be critically endangered and found only in this particular mountain range. Uh, this discovery, the authors say, speaks to the importance of the Namibia peaks, known as the Sky Islands, to bat diversity. And we've got a wonderful artist rendering there of what this bat looks like. Mm. I read this and was deeply fascinated, deeply interested, but also a little bit taken aback by, okay, so it's speciation. We're just kind of fragmenting stuff unnecessarily. Uh -huh. and Great. There's a new classification of bat that somebody wrote a, d a thesis on. Right. Great. So, so that's how you feel about any new species then? Yeah. Okay. Lar largely. Okay. Largely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep branch. I'm a So then Alex is not excited about new species. <laughs> I'm a lumper. I like to. Why do we keep breaking it out into smaller and smaller and smaller groups? Just lump it. Put it oh, into We need to bring a geneticist on the show. We do, because neither of us are geneticists. Agreed. We've had this conversation many times. Right. But I don't see why you would keep branching it out. It doesn't make any difference to me. Jeff, what do you think? Rob says hi. Hi, Rob. Rob. How you doing? <laughs> Glad to have you on the show. We were just talking about bats, brand new species found in Namibia. Um, that's the headlines, guys. Not too much going on. We are exactly on schedule there. It's 720. Uh, when we come back, we're going to have uh, my wife, Rachel, on the show with us. She is a baker, and we thought, what more fun could we have than having her come on and bake treats related to wildlife conservation and using sustainable products. So when we come back, guys, we're going to have Rachel on the program and check out what she made for us tonight. What kind of world is projected for us when many schools and stores have emptied, yet commercial markets selling live wildlife for human consumption remain full? Thought to have been the birthplace of COVID-19, these markets continue on, leaving wildlife exposed to extinction and leaving us exposed to future pandemics. Protecting wildlife means protecting us. Take action now at protectwildlifeprotectus.org. My name is Lynn, and I want to star in a movie. Why is that artichoke talking? I'm a pangolin. Which basically means my tongue is longer than my body. And I'm pretty much for a bowling ball. Oh. But the pangolin piester resistance? We're the only mammals with scales. Pretty neat, huh? Poachers think so, too. You see, people use us for traditional medicine. And leather boots. The situation is critical. Averaging about 100,000 goodbyes a year. I have to do something. I have to star in a movie. If I become famous, pangolins will become famous. People will notice us and finally care about us. So guys, help my species become known. In Hollywood, let me star in a movie. Please! Well, we've got a real treat tonight. We've got Rachel on the show with us, and she's made absolutely delicious looking lava cake. So let's go ahead and cut back to the full thing here. <laughs> we've got Rachel with us tonight. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing good. <laughs> good. Well, today I made lava cake, but this was my second choice. I earlier made some lemon magic case cake because we're doing something on weather. And I thought for winter in California, usually we have a lot of lemons and citrus. You know, when you think weather, you think <laughs> lemon. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Makes sense. <laughs> but that recipe was not good enough. And being the perfectionist you are, <laughs> even though I told her the audience won't know what it tastes like, she said... It was blah. It was blah. So and not she, good enough. <laughs> she made a whole new thing. So I made lava cakes instead. So um, 
these ones don't have as much sustainable things as I would have liked, but. So if you, if you had, if you had a, your go of it, yeah. what would you introduce to it that's sustainable? Maybe um, more fair trade ingredients, like the endangered species chocolate, which is really good. Sure. Um, sustainable sugar, which last time I got fair trade coconut sugar, which was brown sugar, so I couldn't use it for this recipe, but probably the sugar. Um, now, how bad would this screw it up if you put brown sugar in when it wanted white sugar? Well, it didn't actually want white sugar. It wanted powdered sugar, so brown powdered sugar. How many sugars would... are there? <laughs> well, you got powdered sugar. You've got cane sugar. <laughs> this is going to turn into Forrest sugar, Gump, where you're probably just sugar. going. Well, you got uh, you know boiled shrimp and grilled shrimp. And then you can get the sugar that doesn't have actual sugar in it. Shrimp it's on grits. <laughs> fake sugar. There's plenty of sugars. This looks absolutely <laughs> delicious. What are the folks saying at home, Jeff? Well, not much yet, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Not much yet. I also muted myself so I could actually enjoy this without... Well, we're putting you back to work. <laughs> but... Don't now, my understanding... What's that? <laughs> Chris said, don't be sour over the weather. I'm not sour <laughs> over the weather. Also, Brian says, I was going to say it's voiced by Safari Steve about the pangolin. A totally <laughs> sour. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, it was. My understanding is at the White House, they call this chocolate freedom, freedom. which is yeah. pretty cool. That's my only reason to want to visit the White House. Um, <laughs> chocolate freedom. Just for the chocolate freedom. Just for you the chocolate freedom. get fre it just, here. Can you do that? Can you go to the White House cafeteria and get... Well, I've been to D.C. You can go in the White House. I don't think you can visit the cafeteria, though. Uh, you can, however, fun fact, visit the Senate's cafeteria and Fancy. the House of Representatives. You can go in there. And I went in there with... Uh, I was there, what, in 16? And I wore a I Stand with Standing Rock t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Into the Senate cafeteria. And I had, like, Senate aides going, Hey, man, that's a great shirt. That was, that was great. That was really cool. Um... Let's sample some of America's cake here, some chocolate freedom. That's good. Thanks. You guys at home don't know what you're missing. <laughs> the Endangered Species Chocolate is a pretty cool program. I'm hoping to get them on the show as a guest. Um, if you haven't heard of them, it's a product based out of East Africa. Um, and they generate funds to support East African wildlife. Um, and it's... the, the founder and the creator is a guy here on the uh, west coast i want to say i think up in oregon rich philanthropist who just had extra cash to burn you know like we all do and started a chocolate company and they source sustainable ingredients they try to promote um ecological mindfulness um and the chocolate is delicious yeah you've used it in many yeah, recipes yeah definitely it really works well and complements i used it in a chocolate mousse for christmas and that turned out really good mm -hmm. Um, I've used it in cookies and the granola bars last night or last week, which turned out good. You did. So it works pretty well in baking. Yeah. And had I this not been a second choice, I would try to use more things like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get you for next week. Right? This was a surprise creation. Surprise. I love it. <laughs> um, at home, uh, we'll try to post her recipe for lava cake if you want uh, over the week so you can make it for yourself and I don't know next week she'll figure out what she's going to make and we won't post the lemon recipe I think that's not in your forte there yeah it was just blah it I mean, was blah <laughs> the three layers turned out good they did it was like a custard layer and a fudgy layer and then a like a cakey layer all made from the same batter but just the flavor wasn't there sure sure well um, I think on a very related theme ingredients sustainability we're going to pass it over to the musical moment of the week, which is becoming staple and tradition on the show. Uh, this week in particular, we're thinking about sustainable ingredients, weather, because that's that's uh, that's the whole theme of the show tonight. Um, <laughs> Tonight's weather, cold. Weather is cold. <laughs> I'm still in shorts. Um, musical moment of the week. We're going to send you guys south of the border, way far south of the border, uh, to explore some fruit. So we'll mm -hmm. take it away, Jeff. We'll see you in a minute. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way, and when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue, bananas taste the best and are the best for you. You can put them in a salad. Grief? No, not yet, my dear. That greenish way you're looking means that you are ripe for cooking. How about me? No, no. When you are fully ripe, my dear, those little flecks of brown appear. Me? You're most digestible, my friend. Delicious, too, from end to end. Uh. You can put them in a pie. Any way you want to eat them, it's impossible to beat them. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. <laughs> bananas are a solid food that doctors now include in babies' diet. And since they are so good for babies, I think we all should try it. Oh! See, 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 see. Hey, everybody, this book is pretty fantastic. Yes. It's exactly fine. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Chiquita Banana, that's that's a throwback, isn't it? You know about Chiquita Banana. Uh, yeah. How does it relate to Pathfinder? No, it doesn't. Not at all. <laughs> okay. You're like, Pathfinder, Chiquita Banana. Chiquita Banana, that's um, <clears throat> that's a throwback, man. I think that started in the 40s. Is that, uh, well, it's Chiquita, the, I was going to say, is that Dole? No, it's Chiquita Banana. Mm. <laughs> A little bit south of the border, and I thought what a, a perfect relation to not only weather, because bananas grow in a tropical equator environment, um, ingredients. You know, one of the far and away most destructive ingredients that you can purchase are pineapples. Yes. Pineapples 100%. are grown in places like Costa Rica, uh, Panama, Anywhere right, Nicaragua. <clears throat> they grow on massive plantations that take up former rainforests. And I mean, just as far as you can see, are pineapple farms. Um, same thing could be said about numerous, numerous, numerous different, uh, different ingredients you might use commonplace. Things like bananas, things yep. like coconuts. Nutella. Nutella, hazelnut, um, mm. vanilla, sugar. I mean, you name it, yep. throw a dart. It's, it's actually quite challenging to make a recipe that's based solely off of purely sustainable ingredients. So one of the things I think that Rachel, she's just off screen here, tries to do is, is find ingredients that are made locally within your own community. Because if more of us thought along those lines, we might be able to turn the tide a little bit and start addressing some of these greater issues. Uh, you've been down south of the border. Did I you see it. any pineapple plantations? Everywhere. 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 So yeah. did you sample any? Nah, I didn't. Okay. I love I love me a good plantain though. Uh, <laughs> the old mango. I'm trying to catch up with the comments here, see what's going on. Um, what do you got there, what, what, Jeff? I can't quite read that. Brian says not putting bananas in the fridge is propaganda, so your bananas go bad and you have to buy more bananas. <laughs> I love that he Fake would, news. I love that he would point that out. Fake news. <laughs> so, would bananas survive in the fridge then? What if you just yeah. ate your bananas and you oh, didn't I do, have to put them in the fridge? If it's propaganda, could you? Could you? I guess. Rachel, you're the food expert. They go brown sometimes faster because they live in a warm climate. Okay. They do get dark. All right. They like a very, very tropical... That's fair. Whatever the wine is. No, I they see. do start yeah. get speckling a lot quicker. When it's flaked with brown and has a golden hue. <laughs> 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 anyway, guys. Uh, catching up on. I'm just trying to read that. It's a little bit far away. Uh, Chris is not a fan of pineapples, apparently. Not a fan. I have there to be in the mood Chris. for it. Pineapples are like a eh, well, kind of food for me. They're pretty good, amazing. I love pineapple. Mm. I feel personally. I'm with Rachel. Rachel loves pineapple. It's stringy. Thank you. You're right. It's cool. great. I like the flavor, but like the texture of the fruit is stringy. What the All hell? Right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's stringy. All three of us are like we like pineapple, and you're like no. <laughs> I liked. In Hawaii, in Hawaii, they gave us chocolate-covered pineapple. That was good. Okay. Dried, dried pineapple covered in chocolate. 
That was that was. Anyway, we're way off subject now. We're talking about weather. Pineapples, of course, and bananas growing in a tropical uh, climate. But we're thinking about weather, thinking about the broader implications of it. And this book here, Pathfinder, is a book that I, I like quite a lot. It's from South Africa. It's written by Janesta Pulela. Um, this book is by no means supposed to be a detailed <laughs> reference book. It's not supposed to answer all your questions. But it's supposed to help give you a quick access to hey, I've got a question about, I don't know, birds. I can quickly look up a thing, get just that informational nugget I need to get my brain queued up in the right frame of mind. Um, and it covers a, a wider range of subjects here. Um, it's produced by the same training academy that Jeff and I went and trained at, Limpopo Field Guiding Academy, uh, which, which was an awesome school for just kind of generalist guiding. It kind of got you through what you needed and showed you a little bit of everything. Uh, but this book in particular was written by one of their former instructors, Janesta, and she is a birder, although we met her, remember? Yeah, she was delightful. She hated birds. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's a birder. She's famous worldwide for birding, uh, and she hates birds. So, well, how, hang on. I might have questions. How is one a birder? but hates birds. She thought they were boring. That's like if I went to a restaurant that I hated and I kept going back. <laughs> or to a job you don't like and kept going for the money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, Jeff? <laughs> See. <laughs> um, Janessa is delightful. I wish I had a good photo of her queued up for you guys. Um, but she wrote this book, Pathfinder, and there's been a few different versions that have come out. Jeff, you could show us what the inside of the book looks like. Ooh, okay. We're getting a little bit fancier Let's here, guys, so check this out. Ready? Three, two, one, and interior of the book. She actually does all these drawings by hand um, and creates them for you, and then they're, they're beautiful illustrations in the book. And again, this is a, a reference. It's supposed to get your brain in the right frame of mind to then be able to pursue a, an answer with a, a better resource, or if you're guiding and you just need to pull out a quick thing, like let's just flip to any old page here. Oh, look at this, we're on Crocodilia. Um, if you just need a real quick, like, I can't remember, what's that sideways dealio on their eye? You can, here we go, nictating membrane. Great, I've got it. Um, that's all this is. It's a quick reference guide uh, for people that already know what they're talking about. But the illustrations are beautiful. Um, and if you want to get one there, you can see at the bottom of the screen, it's info at Pathfinder, whatever the whole title is, .co.za. It's a long thing that I don't remember. But anyway, uh, she has a whole segment in here on weather. Because again, this book is supposed to ultimately be the guide's guide to guiding. And one of the things a good guide should know about is the weather. Because basically, if you're guiding a safari, your job is to take the guests out show them wildlife, sure, but there's so much more that's involved in that. You're, you're supposed to be a mini plethora to plug them into the world around them. And part of this, actually a huge part of it, is keeping the guests safe. And that means if you're at the lodge and you see the weather is not good, you shouldn't even go out to begin with. You should just keep the guests back at base because it's safer to be there. Um, and like anything, understanding weather starts very fundamentally. So where would you hazard weather starts? Well, this starts with the barrow dropping. Space. Space. The infinite the frontier, frontier. The final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> the space between spaces. <laughs> Looks like we got a drops. few comments there, uh, Jeff. What, what do we have? Uh, cool illustrations. I agree. Janesta does a really, really good job. Um, other than that... You should cut over to your camera so they can see it. I don't know if we've done it. Dipped in, in, in chocolate. Yes. Yum. All about it. Yum. That's a, uh, a favorite know. Disneyland treat. Hi, Jeff. <coughs> Dolus. Frozen right. banana, chocolate. Uh, all about it. Yeah. All about it. Anyway, let's do it. Churros. Great. You have to hit I'm cut or they can't see you. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actively <laughs> avoiding. I know. So, out of context, it's just you and I, and then somebody voiceover. Just some just voice Disneyland of God foods. About us the whole time. <laughs> Dull Disneyland with. treats. Everybody, if you haven't met, this is Jeff. We've got him running producer booths tonight. Banana. He's back there running the whole show. Chocolate. Yes. That's me. Uh, no, weather starts in the atmosphere, yeah. which starts in space. So, if Jeff would pull up the graphic for us, very simply, you got to consider the Earth by itself. And the Earth has several different layers of atmosphere. And I'm sure if we had an expert on, there's 
more than I could ever possibly care to learn about. But I, I actually think weather is quite fascinating. So these are the basics that any good guide should have. Just file away way in the back of their head because it's not information you need every day. You would have the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, ionosphere, and the exosphere. And at different points of the atmosphere, you're going to see different things being able to form, such as you know clouds, where airplanes are flying, where spaceships are flying. Really, you and I and everybody you've ever known, every animal you've ever really seen, habitates the troposphere. And if I'm pulling up in my brain here, griffin vultures fly to what, 35,000 feet? 20. 20,000? Like There's something that goes up to 30,000 feet or higher. I thought it was the griffin yeah, vulture. Yeah, the griffin vulture, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're flying where planes fly. They're basically going to the stratosphere, which is pretty cool. That's that's really high. That's super cool. Um, troposphere, let's just go down some facts here. 16 kilometers deep, 8 kilometers deep at the poles. Stratosphere is 50 kilometers deep. It has ozone. Contrails from airplanes occur here. The air is thin. Mesosphere, meteor is destroyed entering the mesosphere. Thermosphere is... Uh, Minus 1,200 degrees Celsius? That can't be right. It's a bit cold. That's fresh. That's a bit cold. That's friend. fresh. Um, thoughts on the atmosphere? I love it. It keeps me alive. I love the atmosphere. <laughs> I love the atmosphere, because without the atmosphere, I can't bloody breathe, you know? It is a miracle, though, that... Well, here, we've got, we've got a visual aid. The fact that this show exists on this planet, and we can be cognizant enough to look at the planet and understand it and interpret it in this forum brought to you by mammals is a, a bloody miracle it's remarkable all of it as carl sagan said this is the pale blue dot and it's absolutely amazing <clears throat> that you and i are on it i mean we wouldn't know any otherwise but no. well as pandora pandora sure um <laughs> sure it's pretty bloody amazing that considering the entire universe we wound up here. Our atoms are on this pale blue dot. Uh, and as far as we know, every form of life ever has existed only on this pale blue dot. Um, are there forms of life on other planets? Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, and you're a fool if you don't agree. What would, what would you, in your wildest dreams, hazard life on other planets look like? I, my, all right, so in my wildest dreams, I would hope for something that looks like Pandora sure. in Avatar, as aforementioned, right? In reality, I don't know. I, I feel like it's silly to kind of go one way or another because between myself and everybody, everybody else on this planet here, we've only got one point of reference here. You know, it's it's right, silly which for was going to be my point. Where just, yeah. researchers here that send out probes to look for other life yeah. have a habit of saying, "Well, we need to look under Earth's conditions for life." Right. And yeah. I'm like. But with a universe of infinite possibility, like this helicopter flying over the middle of our show. <laughs> hey! Hey, you! Damn pot paparazzi! Be gone. Get out of here! Hi! Uh, <laughs> um, this paparazzi guys, no respect, man. I know, this show took off real quick. None. We're all really famous now. Right. Um, no, to, considering life on other planets, I mean, is there a planet with a life that breathes o uh, CO2? Why not? Why not? There's, Nitrogen. There's, there, we already have life forms on Earth that they, aren't, they are not carbon-based. They're arsenic-based. It's fantastic. Yeah. So. Just incredible. <laughs> and I wish, I wish we had broadened our horizons a little bit. Um, cue next graphic. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, I know we're riveting it? material tonight. Just we're talking about weather. How much more exciting can this possibly get? Look at that. We're talking about the rays of the su a sun on the planet. Now, unless you've been living under a rock or five years old, mm -hmm. seasons change depending on the position of the Earth and the angle of the sun. Um, if you're at the equator, of course, the sun's going to be more intense. And if you're up at the poles, the radiation from the sun is going to be quite a lot less powerful. Um, looks like we got a little bit of activity there, Jeff, on the comments. What, what are po folks saying? Uh, Pam says, is it in the stratosphere? Is what but it is. I don't know stratosphere. what we were talking about. M me? Uh, you? Also, there is um, a large group of people here who want Safari Steve back. Safari Steve? A live thing with Safari Steve. Well, Safari Steve is on assignment now. Safari Steve is on assignment. He's actually in... Uh, <coughs> 
in the, in the deserts bush. of in the deserts of uh, the southern United States. But He's in the bush. I I promise you, season two will have Safari Steve back. Uh, worst case scenario, we're going to have him do a Zoom call with us from some crazy remote bush location. But Boy. as uh, Darwin is my witness. Safari Steve will be on season two, live and in the flesh. Big comments down there. What are those? From uh, right. for for Miss Guido. Yeah, well, we've got two. Big Chris and, and my mom there. What, what do they have to say? Well, well Brian, Brian said, said check, check out, out uh, Wild, Wild Things season two, two podcast and the search, search for life, life on other planets. planets. Nice. Super. Isn't that Dom Monahan's po- podcast? I don't, I don't know. know. I think so. Someone, Someone Google, Google it. it. Maybe. Brian, Brian tell us who is it. Uh, Pippin. Chris, I always, I always liked how Star Wars, Wars has so many intelligent, intelligent life forms that are extremely <coughs> varied, and, and not all are bipedal or humanoid like in Star Trek. Trek. Yes. Right. Star Wars. Okay. There's the big question. Are we Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. I grew up on Star Wars. N- N- nothing against Star Trek. Star Trek is I like Star too Trek. nerdy. I really enjoy it, but There's a line. Star Trek, I think for me, it was always kind of like... Hey, there's a reason we call this sci-fi, uh-huh. right? Science fiction. Right. Why are you trying to recreate plausible reality? Right. It's ruining it. It's not fun for me. I don't like, <laughs> I don't like Star Trek. Okay. You know, as a kid, I wanted to be Han Solo. I wanted to fly the Millennium Falcon right. you know, and through be the cool. galaxy. And be cool. Yeah. Wear a leather vest. Yeah. You know, have a cool gun and a Sweet fuzzy weather. friend. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, hey, you could still have a fuzzy friend. Listen, I'm just a simple Furry. man making my way through the universe. Is that a song? Boba Fett. Boba Fett. <laughs> so you guys watch The Mandalorian. I don't. So good. And left out. Uh, where were we? <laughs> Sun's, uh, um, Sun's effect on the, the planet. <laughs> Jeff, you cut the camera too. Oh, oh God. Sorry, I'm lost, lost in the comments, comments now. now. Um, cool. Camera, camera two. two. Are, are we ready? ready? Fade. Yeah, All right, Bill Nye, the science guy, kind of effect for you guys here. We've got planet Earth, which is solar powered, and it's not sunny, otherwise it'd be working. And then here's the sun, um, which you can see because I've got a light shining on the planet. Now, at the equator, the light's going to be the strongest, and the further up you go uh, toward the poles, the weaker the light's going to become over time. And as the Earth orbits the sun, it's shifting its axis and that that can change because it's wobbling so over millennia that's that's shifting all the time but the seasons are formed if you didn't know this and we're doing very basic science now uh, (laughs) by how close your pole is tipped toward the sun so right now we're around about like this so look at that there's australia hello hello and south africa right the whole southern hemisphere is getting more exposure to sunlight than the northern hemisphere We're getting less radiation and less light hours. But as the Earth shifts, come around March, April, May, it's going to start to point this way. And by June, we're going to be at our our harshest angle. So we're going to have our longest day of the year. The Southern Hemisphere will have its shortest day of the year. (coughs) Here's your very practical, hands-on, Bill Nye the Science Guy effect on Misguided for the week of January, whatever the date is. Yeah. Um, Hello. Back to weather. What Remarkable. were we talking about? Jeff, cut over to our other angle. The width. And our next slide, if you don't mind. And sure. I see some more comments, so maybe just kind of catch us up to speed here. Give me a second. So we're going to go to our next <coughs> slide. And boom. I think we just covered that. Oh, did we? I think so. Um, yes. Boom. There we go. This is going to be a good one. First comments, though, real quick. Comments, yes. yes. Talking, Talking about, about Star Wars, Wars. Uh, everyone's more Star Wars. Nice, Star good track. people. You guys are good. This is the why. You are good and pure. Uh, uh, Brian, Brian says Lara Krantz, season, season one, is on Bigfoot. Big so I guess Lara's the host of that podcast, maybe? I am. So it sounds like a pseudoscience podcast. Uh, I'm always blown my m- uh, That's kind of weirdly phrased. It's always blown my mind that summer is... Summer in the U.S. is winter on the other side of the globe. I guess that makes sense. My goal is to only ever live in the summer, to travel to the southern hemisphere for half the year and then the northern hemisphere for the other half. Because I don't, A, I want to get skin cancer, and B, uh, (laughs) this year I'm stupid. I get two winners. Two winters. Two winners. Because you hate yourself. Yes. I'm trying to only live in perpetual summer. And I'd rather be in South Africa than here. (laughs) Me too, but hey, if I had a choice of... (laughs) 
I'd rather be somewhere warm. Kenya, maybe, where the sure. sun's shining longer. Um, if uh, hold on, that that quick uh, wind effect. If you could pull that out, that's the slide before Jeff. Oh yeah. So if you're north of the uh, equator, the winds are going to shift one way, and if you're south of the equator, the winds are going to shift another. And if Jeff, if you would just pull up PowerPoint there and then quick play, like I showed you earlier. There you go. Pull that guy up, and then just hit play real quick. Oh, look at that! It's Yikes. The computer is cold. No, it's that one's running fine. This one. Yeah, there you go. Is it playing? Yeah, it's playing. There it goes. Look at that. Now that's giving you a little bit of a practical practical demonstration over the course of a year for how the winds are actually affect, affected and, and operating on our planet. Uh, that's a, a real satellite-based uh, imagery setup, uh, giving you a visual of, of the way the winds move, the way the clouds are moving. Uh, I find it really interesting. Check that out, Zach. You can see the equator belt precisely, and it's got a very persistent haze just over it. That is the most remarkable thing I've seen today. Are you sure? I think so. Because you've seen a lot of things today. You've been oh. awake for, what, 13 hours? A little bit. Yeah. Round about. Sounds like ooh. we have an owl in the distance. An owl. An owl has come to join us. Are we off to Hogwarts? I think so. <laughs> You're a wizard, Harry. You're a wizard, Harry. Let's talk about clouds. Clouds? I love me some clouds. I promise this relates to wildlife, guys. Just bear with us a little bit longer. He's pulling it up here. Just Work. give it. There you go. Clouds. Look at that oh fun graphic. God. Look how fun that is. <laughs> that took Look me all that. of about 15 minutes. <laughs> For you at home, you're welcome. Look at that. Clouds. He said in cloud like font on a blue sky with clouds in the background. <laughs> Zach, what's your favorite kind of cloud? Cumulonimbus. Cumulonimbus. Why? Cumulonimbus. In, in detail. Tell it us. Just the fine details and there's the wisps and the fluff. They're just, yo, it's good. Jeff, favorite cloud? Uh, I was going to say the same, same thing, thing, actually. He took your cloud. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, you know. They're powerful, uh, you know? I'm trying to think of another one that's serious. Cool. Another cloud that you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Name all the Basically. clouds, Jeff. <laughs> Name more clouds. Well, <laughs> thankfully, I have a little thing right here that has all of them. Perfect. A little cheat sheet. In fact, let's show the, the kind viewers at home who are putting up with this absolutely delightful white knuckle ride of a misguided episode. Let's show you guys some clouds. Look at that right there. It's a there. bit fast and loose, this now, episode. Oh, hold, hold. You can just hold on to your seats, everybody. This episode is a roller coaster of emotion and feelings and content. Waiting with bited breath. Weather. This is like the, the junior college class that you just kind of cashed it in for and hoped would get over quickly uh, on your way to a cooler class. Look at how many different kinds of clouds we have here. Um, pretty basic, but they're all dependent on what layer of the atmosphere they're in, and they're dependent on the kind of wind and pressure and humidity that you might find within that given region. And again, if you're a guide, if you're about to head out on a drive, it's worth a look maybe at the forecast, that's your cheat sheet, or just up at the sky, because you can tell a lot looking at the sky itself. Like today was clear, but we had some clouds rolling in that are suggesting uh, there is a pretty serious storm on the way. The next few days are going to be pretty wet. Um, <clears throat> we had some stratocumulus moving in. The atmospheric river. Atmospheric river. By Tuesday, this is going to be wet and wild, guys. Um, Jeff, you'd advance to our next picture there. Let's just kind of walk through. There's, there's a few basic cloud types that I think are worth taking a peek at. And I can't quite read that from this distance. So if you just tell us, what's our first one? It is... <gasps> Cumulus. Now, what does cumulus mean? Uh, cumulus means beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> cumulus means beautiful. Cumulus, cumulus uh, means sure. dreams. It means daydreams. Yeah, it's the kind of cloud that you see bunny ears in. Yeah, like, like the clouds that look like people or things. People, or dinosaurs, or yeah. Pokemon. You, you lay in the field, look at that, and you look up at the sky and you just kind of daydream, uh, which is exactly what these clouds are, and they typically indicate fair weather is approaching. Yeah. 
uh, which is which is nice. They're often associated with very light, f uh, comfortable breezes, a general warming trend, because they tell you a warm front is on the way. So life is life is going to be good, yeah. for, at least for the next 24 hours, because. It's not really pr worth predicting weather past about 24 hours because it can change fairly suddenly. Um, next set of clouds, Jeff. Are you ready? I'm ready, are you ready? Stratus. Stratus, dense, low-lying, dark gray, steady rain. These are the kind of clouds you expect to see in England and France and Germany and all places not worth ever traveling to <laughs> because they are flyover places. All of Europe is a flyover continent on your way to cooler places. I'm fired. <laughs> a whole region of the planet just screamed just now. Well, hey, they they colonized the world because they were looking for a better food and somewhere more comfortable to live. Europe sucks. Don't you guys agree at home? Europe is just a cold, icy f wasteland. <laughs> It's We're a making bunch it of our goal to just offend every group on the Cheese eating snobs. Sacre bleu! C'est impossible! Really, though, they, you know. Why would you put up with that for that many months of the year? Good food. <laughs> Good food. Good food. Which they stole from other parts of the world. Cool you know, culture. the Crusades. Let's just colonize. Neat history. All of the Middle East and then steal their spices. <laughs> And then say, hey, this is, oh, this is French cuisine. <laughs> no, it's Middle Eastern influenced food that you stole and ripped off. Chris says, oh, come on, Alex, the lake, lake districts of the UK. Three exclamation points. I'm good. I, if you want to go, Chris, totally up to you. But I'd rather go somewhere warm, A, B, has good food, and C, has cool wildlife. Because, you know, as fun as badgers are, <laughs> or Scottish Highland cats. Uh, I'm good. I told you weather was fun. <laughs> so he he's, he'd also love to go to the Swiss Alps. In Svalbard, Norway? That you could, betcha. A walrus, maybe. Polar bears, man. Fuck you, that's amazing. <laughs> Sun bear. So aggressive. A 12 foot bear, that's bloody cool. Sun bear. Those are cool too. But don't ride off the polar bear. Better than polar bear. Nonsense. Ridiculous. <laughs> Even polar bears don't want to be in the polar regions. <laughs> they're built for the polar regions. Nah, they don't know like better. <laughs> How do we get out of here? Maybe if we turn brown. <laughs> what did you do to the polar bears? They're all brown now. <laughs> Okay. Moving on. Listen up, mammals. So we're going to do a misguided takes Europe series. And hold this on. conversation hold on, hold on. will change immediately. Oh, i got to process that. Yeah. Oh. Euro trip misguided. <laughs> Just grumpy Harrison Ford on the Orient Express. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's one, well, it's not even part of Europe. I was going to say there's one part of Europe I'd want to go, and it's far eastern Russia. But that's Asia. That's, hey, Eurasia. I'll go to Eurasia. There you go. But not full Europe. But to get to Eurasia, you've got to go through Europe. I'll never forget, Jeff. You remember landing in Frankfurt on the way home from Africa, just decked out in deep suntans and oh, yes. bush khaki for days. Yes, short shorts. It was great. Yeah, there was. we met all those people in the airport, and one lady in particular, we were getting on the airplane, and she was like, Excuse me, but what do you do? And I turned to her, you remember? And I, I'm just full khaki, giant backpack. I went, I'm a safari guide on my way home from a, from a trip in the bush. And her eyes just glazed over. What are you talking about? This is incredible. Good people. Uh, ben and I were together. I think we were getting coffee or something. And uh, some dude came up wanting to take a picture with both of us because of our short shorts. Yeah, you guys look kind of gay. So good. Like the Mickey Mouse, dude. People want to just take a picture with you it's on the street. Amazing. Even oh, like in Mickey how, Mouse. even How's in the, the Johannesburg doing, airport, Jeff? people are looking at you weird. It was unbelievable. What, yeah. are, what are the comments doing, yeah. Jeff? Um, let's see. So uh, they're all like, yeah, to Europe. Europe's great. Uh, Pam likes your comment about polar bears. Don't know any better. Uh, yes. Chris says, take Alex to the Black Forest. Hello? Black Forest ham is okay. Uh-huh. 
I'm going to assume some football team just scored a thing. Because we're hearing screaming. For what? Brian uh, Everly says, I'm down with polar bears and northern lights any day. Don't this Scottish wildcat. <laughs> I'm a Scotsman. Then your whole viewership was like, Europe's a mice. <laughs> I'm a Scotsman. I can diss Scottish wildcats. I just am thinking of Ron Swanson uh, taking photos of, like, Big Ben. Quacks, we don't have those in America. Ron Swanson <laughs> has never been anywhere before. That's a made-up character. <laughs> um, He's no different than the people of Walmart. Easy, big fella. Um... That mic is so good, I can... It's picking up his scream. I can hear it in the earbud. Is it 8 o'clock? It's oh, 8 o'clock. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I don't know where you guys are from in the world. Some of you are from California. Some of you are from other places. What? It was a thing in the middle of the pandemic out here that everyone would start shouting and howling at 8 o'clock, which it is now precisely 8 o'clock. Um, <laughs> I guess that's what these people are doing. I, I thought that was gone. I think it was weird. I said it all. It's weird. This it's back there. now. Okay. Moving on. Next cloud. Moving on. And. Nimbostratus. Dense, low, dark gray, associated with low pressure systems and rain, like we're about to get, because we had some Nimbostratus moving through the area just a little while ago. You saw them, right? I saw them. You knew they were Nimbostratus, too. I was working on my laptop and I looked out the window and I was like, this is a Nimbostratus. No, you were like, sure. Sure. Nimbostratus, yes. Those are, nim those are Nimbostratus. And if you see those kind of clouds, it might not be worth going out on a drive because it could get a bit messy, a bit wet. You might see a few cool things, but think about the comfort of the guests. Is there it worth is driving? one animal that comes out in the rain. There's actually a number of animals that come out in the rain, but there's one in particular that is specifically oh, very wait, cool. I can't remember what that character is called. Anyway, continue. Uh, it's a thread snake. I'm good. Did you see the thread snake? No. You don't even know what it looks like. I'm How do you know? It could be amazing. It'd be the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Uh, listen, guys. So imagine, like, it's a snake that's about yay big. And they're, like, thin. Like, they're very, very thin. And they look like liquid metal just moving through the red sand. They're very cool. And they come out, like, just before a rain. They're super neat. They, like, eat ants and stuff. They're really so tiny. pythons. Pythons don't eat ants. Rock pythons come out before rain. Sure, but they don't look like liquid metal. I'm okay. <laughs> then all the herpetologists around the world just screamed. <laughs> I'm not a herpetologist. Uh, next cloud. <laughs> Cirrostratus. Cirrostratus. We've got a halo around the sun and moon approaching warm Oops. front. So those are the kind of clouds I always hope. Uh, clouds that tell you fair weather is approaching. Clouds that tell you that positivity is on the way. Clouds that tell you you can wear shorts and not be judged by people at Whole Foods. That's so good. Which is, a, you know, I thought Whole Foods was a judge-free place. That's what they tell you. That's what they tell you. How many more clouds do we have over there, Jeff? Great question. Oh. Um, let's find out. We have... Oh, oh good. One there more. There are literally two more slides. Put up the next one. Let's just this pull one. the band-aid off. Here we go. Boom. What's that one? Alto cumulus. Alto cumulus. Fair weather. So you usually see those later in the day, and the next day is clear as a bell, as they say in the south. And our final cloud must be. Sir cumulus. That's what I was gonna guess. Mackerel sky, no rain. So that's those are those beautiful sunsets we all hope for and long for, and look at very. Very, uh, very much with a keen eye for Instagram because those photos often show like up this there. one here. I don't see a single cloud. That's just a magma sunset. It's a magma sunset. That's yeah, beautiful. Uh, where are we at the comments there? I see a few, a few folks were joining us. <clears throat> where did we leave off? Don't discard Scottish wildcats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you are Brian. Do you call that a tower? Try the Sears Tower, friend. Uh, next, next one, one was Eberly, says we still have 8 o'clock howlers. Chris says, Shah! Shah! LOL. Is that, that the, the Wayne, Wayne World impersonation? impersonation? Question mark? No, so... I, I get where you're coming from, but uh, Chris, the, the Shah is kind of a... It's, it's just more of a 
Southern Africa kind of expression, it, it can mean a lot of things, but it's an expression of excitement, concern, question, really fill in the blank. Uh, like the Italians would say allora, which kind of means well then, so then you just add it to a sentence. Um, here in America, we say um, or like. In Australia, we say struth. Struth. So give us a, an example. Struth, that's good vodka. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Shah or ish are kind of just South African versions of that. Is all. You were asking about shoes earlier, valleys, right? Just a simple leather shoe with... Actually, the, the bottom can be made of almost anything. Traditionally now, they're made out of car tires, which is cool. Just cut up a car tire, stitch a shoe to it, and away you go. That's a good look. I love it. Yeah. Um, that final slide for us, Jeff, if you don't mind. Sure. And boom. Look how simple that, guy, that is, guys. Heat plus pressure, or wind, equals weather. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't know that. Because <laughs> I graduated high school. Because <laughs> I graduated high school. <laughs> you mean elementary school? Well, it's like sixth grade science right there. Or grade six, as or Europeans say. Or Bill Nye. Or watched Bill Nye. <laughs> um, heat plus uh, pressure or wind equals weather. And that, that's really the basis of it all. And that was, I think, mostly just... Weather isn't hard. It, it's easy to kind of look out the window and get an, a good idea for what you're going to be dealing with. I just find that so many people, and you might agree, live their lives indoors too much. Correct. So anything outdoors is, ooh, what's happening, you know? Right. I always, like, blows my mind when I go to a pack and I see people just, like, on a, on a walk or something. And then, like, a guard of snake, like, happens to be on, like, the grass line before it goes out in the pavement. And they goes across the road and people just lose their mind like it's not a bloody tiger what's it gonna do people know? lose their mind over deer or anything squirrels the, oh wow rats the deer <sighs> and i'm like go outside dude deer are everywhere they're everywhere they? um what, what what's not descent into just shitting on society indoor people indoor cats right let's phrase it that right. way you're either an indoor cat or an outdoor cat. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know. I just, it's it's a shame to me that in the Western world, we're so accustomed to smooth, paved surfaces and just cool, air-conditioned rooms. Cookie cutter. Cookie cutter. That we're, we're not comfortable being outdoors anymore. And we're, right. we're, it's like camping is a big deal. Oh, we're, we're outside. Where am I going to go to the bathroom? One of my biggest pet peeves is how loosely the word adventure is used. We're going on an adventure. Oh, are you? You went to San Francisco. You it's went on a walk. It's an adventure. At the dog park. Mm. It's an adventure. Awesome. Well, I guess adventure can be used properly. But to circle back, <coughs> the weather, not hard. No. Worth a look. Knowing no. a few basic clouds like we threw up there, I think is a good way to start. Just kind of knowing, if you look up at the sky, what are you seeing? What does it mean? Is it wise to continue what you're doing? <laughs> That's kind of the basic of it, yeah. right? Um, what do you? So we just had an earthquake the other night. That was weird. If you're not from California, earthquakes are a thing we have here from time to time. Right. Although people from other states think they happen just all the time. That was my first California earthquake. Like proper earthquake. Like proper earthquake. Because since you've been here, there's been several. But I, I haven't noticed them. Not one that shook things. Like, like, so I live in like a big apartment building and like it shook the whole building for a time. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> I looked at my dog and I said, Mao, things are happening. This things are crazy. happening. You know, people, people <clears throat> freak out over that kind of stuff. And I just, it's important to, re well, here, I'll pull up my visual aid again. It's important to remember that we live on a dynamic ball that is alive. And things are happening all the time. This planet is, you know, spinning and it's orbiting. And it is, for whatever reason, that we don't fully understand it's going the wrong way, uh, a living, breathing entity with every form of life that we've ever been aware of. And I think that's pretty cool. I do. That's really special. And depending on where you are on this blue ball, you're going to witness different kinds of life. You're going to witness different kinds of weather. You're going to witness different natural phenomena. Uh, and it's worth plugging yourself into some of this. You know... We're in the middle of a pandemic. I think finally there's a solid light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. We have a good chance of knowing in a year we'll probably be on the other side of this. Yeah. No doubt. 
which is kind of where my head was at anyway. I thought this this will take two years, no One. no other way. But when we get to the other side and can start moving again and can start experiencing the world again, do you think it's going to be different? Do you think people are going to kind of come out with a, a refreshing sense of we just lost a lot. We lost time. We lost holidays. We lost personal connection. Um, now it's time to make it up. I think there will be a certain demographic that thinks this way, but overall as a group, I don't know. Content to go back to Disneyland? Content to go back to Disneyland. Same same old movies, same old Disney. <laughs> same old Marvel. WandaVision brought to you by Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Hard there. Uh, <laughs> How are we doing in the comments, Jeff? Uh, comments. Brian says, hey, I get excited when I see a deer. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's go uh, looking for snow leopards one day. How's that sound? Uh, Chris says, you can seriously learn a lot about yourself spending a few days in the wild. You can. Even more if you do like a month or several months no contact just you just trying to bring back what that feels like it's been it's been so long too long <laughs> at any rate um i guess now is the part of the show where we're just going to sit and awkwardly wait to see if anybody has questions comments concerns um issues maybe they hated the show maybe they tuned out five minutes in maybe this maybe this was a waste of time maybe weather was too big of a gamble uh to talk about i thought weather is cool this is amazing is this, it this is all great what and we didn't even get into the 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 dense part of weather. Ritty, we didn't get into Ritty. fronts and occluded fronts and adiabatic winds and the Coriolis effect. Yeah, I think Chris said something about uh, cold front versus warm front equals tornado in the comments. Yeah, he's from the Midwest. He should know that. Tornadoes are his version of earthquakes. Silence. <laughs> what? Sorry? Are you talking to me? I got distracted with other things. <laughs> Um, we didn't get into lightning or <laughs> <laughs> hail or any of that stuff. Or the rest of weather. <laughs> the rest of <laughs> We talked about clouds. Clouds. And we learned about clouds. <laughs> we talked about clouds. Um, <laughs> Your mom and dad stayed the whole time. They did, and I'm very thankful that they did. Because they're looking at this going... What is he doing with his life? Bless. Hey. Hey, it's Saturday. This and is my free time. And you have a TV show. Well, let's, let's not speak too strongly there. You have an online show. I have an online internet self-produced show. Brought to you by mammals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's Saturday. It's, I think, a good use of time. Right. Uh, it's better than playing video games or watching football like yeah. those people were doing. Yeah, those guys over there. Um, yeah, well, weather is, of course, a lot more dynamic. Are there other things to get into? Sure, we could talk about sunny days and chroma keys. It's making me think this conversation would be way more fascinating with somebody who, like, studies weather. It would be, but we I didn't have anybody on. weather man. <laughs> hey, what about a weather woman? <laughs> weather person. A weather... Get a weather person, person. on the show. <laughs> a weather human on the show. Um, I agree. I, I thought at the very least we'd just pull out the book and, and, and bullshit. Through. About Have a flip through. Have an old flip through. Yeah. We'll talk about positive ions and lightning and yeah. all that stuff we never got yeah. into. Precious systems. Um, at, at, at any rate, guys, we were going to have Brent Leo Smith on the show tonight. He unfortunately is delayed due to weather. So I'm hoping maybe he can rejoin us next week. We're going to have to shuffle the schedule a little bit. Uh, coming up s shortly, we're going to have John Whitehouse. A friend of all of ours, he is an astronomer. He is far more knowledgeable on astronomy. So Although, excited. there is a chapter on astronomy in this book. Can we just read that instead? No, we need John. We need John. We need um, John. Coming up here on future episodes, we're going to have real guests on the show. People that actually know what they're talking about. Beyond several idiots sitting around a computer talking about whatever. Uh, people that actually devote their life to certain subjects or devote their life to certain pursuits. Um, we've got a whole roster of folks lined up for the rest of the season. It uh, looks like Jeff might have something for us. Brian Eberly says, question. Question. What's your favorite weather on an adventure and where? 
I am a sunshine kind of guy, but I do like, I like tropical weather. I like it because it, it changes often. And I know that's very vague, but I mean like you get up in the morning, it might be a nice sunny morning, clouds rolling. You might get a bit of rain for an hour dissipates. You might, I mean, it's humid, it's hot. You feel that in the air, it sticks to you. It's clingy. Um, I like weather that's dynamic and changes a lot, but I'm personally a fan of warm weather. If it's hot, I'm into it. I, gr I mean, mom and dad are watching. They know we grew up in the central Valley where summer times it's like 85 at two in the morning. Mm. It's hot. What about you? About my favorite weather, favorite weather. Um, and the fact that Australia is just one big hellscape, right? Pretty much. <laughs> it's hot and wet or hot and dry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. It, it kind of depends. Like, I, I, I like warm. Warm is good. Because I, I feel like with warm environments, you get, like, a more dynamic wildlife. You get more dynamic bi plant biodiversity. And I think there's just more, you, you, there's more to do, you know. Um, I, I come from a very hot and humid part of Australia. Um, and so that, that kind of jazz is, is like kind of old news for me personally. But like, I feel like when I look at like weather, like my perfect day is like 85 breezy and there's like a body of water nearby. Um, I, I guess the weather of the Sobarnsberg in South Africa, say around about January, it's good. It's good. No, just warm, sunny, happy. I like that. That's good. So not Svalbard. Again, not Europe. Okay. No, I know you're all thinking something different. Not hey, Europe. Listen. Europe hey, has hey, like mammals, two good if, days a if year. If you guys fund like a, a Euro trip from Misguided, we can change this man. Yeah. Hey, if they'll fund we a way. Try. Come out the end of it loving Europe. If they'll fund a way for me to go experience Europe. Okay. <laughs> I promise you, I won't love it. I promise you. It'll be remarkable. <laughs> I will, this, this segment is recorded. It is, so and it'll know. be on YouTube in 48 hours. Right. Um, change my mind. Europe is not worth traveling to. Bold, bloody claim. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, come on, man. It's basically Disneyland. Is it? It is. <laughs> There is a Disneyland in Europe. There is. If there's a Disneyland there, I don't want to go. There is not a Ouch. single Disneyland on the continent of Africa. I am happy about that. There's not a single Disneyland in Australia. I'm happy about that. There's not a single Disneyland in South America. I couldn't be happier. There is a Disneyland in Europe and Asia, and I'm like, eh, is okay. it worth traveling to? All right. <coughs> there's three in Asia. Yeah, again, is it worth traveling really? to? So there's yeah. Hong Kong and there's Japan. Where's the other one? Shanghai. Ah, there's two in China. There's two in China. That's how they get you. Yeah. All right, yeah. fair. But there's none in India, right? No. Correct. There you go. That's the good part of Could Asia. Could you imagine Disney <laughs> Mumbai? Thank you. Come again. Don't say that. We get canceled immediately. Disney <laughs> Mumbai would be cool. Um, sure. But your words, if there's a Disneyland there, we can't go. <laughs> I did just say that. So you just I struck remember, India off the map just then. Well, India, I'm going to count as separate because um, it should be its own little thing. I remember, and mom and dad can back, back me up on this. We we took the Disney cruise. You were on a Disney was cruise? Was it magical? It was. Round How about, was this? I don't know. If they comment here, I can't remember, guys. Was that 2002 or 2003? Somewhere in there. We sailed on the Disney Wonder. Oh, we went to question. Florida, was which one? and the Wonder was like a brand new ship then. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Disney World, we did the whole thing. Um, we got on the ship after seeing, we drove past Cape Canaveral and we went through the Caribbean. Mm. Um, I remember two things about that trip. One, <clears throat> we landed on some tiny island in the middle of the Caribbean, and Disney had bought like half the island, right, and built this whole elaborate Disney thing. And the other half of the island was like a very rural, I don't, I want to say the wrong word here, not economically well <laughs> community that relied heavily on cruise ship tourism. Mm -hmm. You get my, my right. Thought? We should do a whole episode on tourism. 
I think it is worth our, our time. We should bring on an expert though, so it's not just us. Great. I remember though, as a kid- Well, we, we do a better job than we did about weather. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't realize that the Disney side of the island like was a thing. So we went to the other side of the island. Mm. And the overwhelming memory I have is we went out onto this beach that just the smell of, of I don't even know what sewage was so powerful. And there were like needles in the sand and then to all these little shops that I mean, that memory just really sticks with me. Um, because it was my first time being kind of abroad and realizing not everywhere in the world was like the United States. I mean, that was a deep visual impact. And then we went to the next island, and Disney, again, had kind of a thing, and we found it that time. And you could go out in the bay, and Disney had this, like, play structure built in the middle of the bay, oh. right? So I'm out playing around on it. And then we hear a voice from the beach, and it's like a lifeguard saying, everybody out of the water, there's a flock of rays that have come into the area, uh -huh. right? So a whole herd of stingrays showed up. Oh, cool. And we're like swimming through the water. And cool. I'm an idiot who's <coughs> however old. I didn't, I didn't hear him. So suddenly I'm by myself on this giant wooden play structure in the middle of the water. And you look out and there's just rays everywhere. All right, cool. And everyone's on the beach. <laughs> and they're telling me, you need to come back now because it's not safe to be out there. And they instructed me to like get in the water and like drag my feet to churn up sand because I said if a ray sat there and buried itself and you step on it, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna barb you. Boy. So I'm just like terrified, dragging my feet in water. <laughs> Have you ever seen footage of how Disney. a stingray like actually stings? It's like fast. It's, it's wild because like yeah. like you guys know what stingrays look like. So it's like you've got this flat, plain surface. Tail goes back this way. So this animal actually like arcs its tail like a scorpion, like like forward it's amazing like, like the first time i actually saw footage of that i'm just like whoa that's really cool yeah, yeah and it's like repeated right yeah. it's fast yeah um hugh stever went oh close to home <laughs> his uh his daughter is about to have a baby yay yeah the the genes <laughs> live on <laughs> <laughs> At any rate. Bendy, if you're watching, congratulations. I'm proud of you. Yeah, congratulations, Bendy. Uh, um, As a fellow Queenslander, good on you. Any last minute uh, questions, comments, concerns, Jeff? Uh, you know, a few comments from Mom. Um, oh, another one just came in. Uh, Castaway K was the island Disney owned. Was that Brian? No, uh, your mom. Castaway oh, K. Castaway K. Thanks, Mom. Time warp. Thanks, Mom. Does it. I mean, I have m other memories of that trip, Mom, but does it make you feel good knowing that of the islands we stopped on, my memories are beach that smelled like sewage covered in needles and <laughs> being on a wooden play structure surrounded by <laughs> stingrays? <laughs> the ship was nice. I remember all kinds of fun stuff about that, but of the islands we stopped at, those are the two memories I have. Um, on that happy note, it is about that time, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We're always deeply appreciative that you have made time to sit back and join us on Misguided and include your comments, questions, concerns, whatever you have. It's live and interactive. Uh, coming up next week, I'm hoping we have Brent Leo Smith with, with us, but you know, it is what it is. I know that we're communicating literally half a globe away and trying to coordinate things and make it easy for everybody. So if he's with us next week, great. If not, we'll have uh, John Whitehouse with us to talk about astronomy. Uh, so actually a real person that knows what they're talking about. And he is such a wonderful mind to interact with and engage with. So I can't wait to have him on the show with us. Um, that's all I've got. You got anything? Stay wild, guys. Stay wild, guys. <clears throat> we'll see you next week.